what I realized with great terror when Professor Butler was delivering her perfectly structured remarks over the past two days that there's a cultural difference uh, where some disciplines read papers and others make stuff up as they go along. Um, so, uh, so, my, so I'm going to be doing the latter. Uh, uh, so what, I, what I'm interested in today um, is actually a project that I know from the inside. I know it from the inside because when I was an assistant professor at Cornell before I moved to Michigan, I, uh, I was a roommate of a Butler scholar in 1995 to 97, my friend Jordana Rosenberg, who was constantly, uh, we were screaming at each other till five in the morning about gender trouble and, you know, I was like, it's unclear, I can't understand it. And, and so then after those huge arguments, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I know what people say when they try to delegitimize things, because then I, then I would use Jordana's arguments after that mm -hmm. to show people that this was philosophy and they were, they, were, uh, they were using these strange disciplinary divisions to, uh, they, were, they, were, they were employing notions like clarity in ideological ways. And so what I wanted to do was sort of systematize well, what, what, what's happening now in philosophy. I think it is a revolution led by some of the figures that uh, Maria mentioned, Langton, uh, Saul, Haslinger, Christy Dotson, um, Charles Mills, uh, I would add Patricia Hill Collins, <laughs> Audre Lorde, but uh, the, uh, uh, th that makes us rethink, that makes us think of the disciplinary distinctions we draw in philosophy as itself a subject of philosophical discussion. Like, how did that happen? How did we start thinking that way? How did we start drawing these distinctions? Um, now, in discussing Marx, uh, Wendy Brown usefully distinguishes critique from criticism. Uh, she writes, mere criticism marks religion as false. Critique connects religious illusions and the need for them to the specific reality generating and necessitating religious consciousness. And I think what we need to do is we need to uh, both criticize the apparatus, the arguments that are intended to draw these exclusionary boundaries uh, in philosophy that say exclude critical race theory and feminism from being philosophy. We need to criticize those arguments in Brown's sense. And we also need to critique them. We also need to say what, what leads people, what is it in people's identity that leads them to give such bad arguments. Um, so, uh, so um, now, so what I'm going to do uh, here, um, it's of a piece of, it's of a piece with Professor Butler's, uh, uh, what I've been reading, maybe because this is what I'm thinking about lately, is the sort of problematizing agency. Uh, thinking about new ways to think about agency other than the liberal one. I want to think about neutrality and how, how coherent neutrality is as a philosophical ideal. Because I think, think something like neutrality is going on with critiques of philosophy, with, with the disciplinary um, uh, divisions uh, that I grew up with. And I think and I'm going to draw on the work of the figures who's in, who influenced me. Um, m I think the paper that's most influenced me is by Christy Dotson, uh, How Is This Paper Philosophy? Also a great title. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, uh, but also Eileen O'Neill, Charles Mills, the other people who've been theorizing for decades about what the heck, you know, like, uh, you know, I remember telling my co Yale colleague, who's also my Rutgers colleague, Jonathan Kramnik, you know, when I took Hume, I was told that Hume's hobby was history. Like, so, in other words, Hume's historical interests had nothing to do with his philosophical interests. You know, what was going on with that? Or like, Hume, when I was writing my book on ideology and propaganda, I discovered that Hume, I was like, wow, Hume, it's weird that he doesn't have a politi social and political philosophy, given that he's just talking about ideology all the time. And then I discovered first principles of government. I was like, oh, I wonder why that's not taught. Um, so, uh, so, so it's not just it's not just areas of philosophy. It's not just. Um, I mean, I think I think what what we what we have to realize, and this is why Eileen, Eileen O'Neill's work in early modern is so important, and Charles Mills' work uh, uh, 
in the racial contract and, and, um, and uh, ideal theory as ideology is so important um, because they call our attention to the, uh, the particular historicity of, uh, of our moment and, uh, and how the exclusions function uh, not just to exclude certain groups but also to exclude the also to exclude famous dead white men like John Dewey is only read by critical race theorists anymore in philosophy. <laughs> you know that's like uh, it's because you know what's going on with that? <laughs> well, it's because he thinks philosophy of education is central to democratic political theory. And if you think philosophy of education is very central to democratic political theory, maybe you're going to have to read Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Maybe you're going to have to read a whole bunch of other figures who write on education who aren't white men, or you know, do or you're going to talk about pragmatism and that affects Elaine Locke and a bunch of um, theorists thinking about race. So, uh, or Lisa Shapiro made to me the point, she's like, yeah, and it even affects, I mean, I guess I just made this point with Hume, it even affects what we read within, in the canon. Like, I read in my political philosophy class in graduate school, I have to admit, I was highly turned off to normative theory, and hence I became a philosopher of logic, because I was like, that's not about oppression. <laughs> that's about shining cities. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so, you know, we read Rousseau's Social Contract, but we never read Emile, you know, because Emile, well, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, so, uh, and that's because philosophy of education gets cut out. Um, so, uh, and it's, it's important to emphasize, this isn't even true of the analytic tradition. Okay, Frege had some political writings, don't read them, please. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but Russell wrote a book on power. Susan Stebbing, the founder of Analysis, the journal Analysis, has two books on ideology, Thinking to Some Purpose, and her, uh, and um, in, uh, in 1939, and a book in 1941, I'm now blanking on the name, but both are on ideology. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, uh, right, and, and so it's not like, and Noam Chomsky, is an analytic philosopher. And his political philosophy, you know, deeply influences me as a political philosopher. I don't know why it's not considered part of the canon. So I think that, of the uh, part of analytic political philosophy. So I think we have to ask, like, what's going on? It's a very interesting philosophical question. It's, it's actually a question of, you know, like, how possibly did things end up this way? And that's what you have a bunch of people thinking about right now. So my hypothesis, having been in this position arguing with my roommate at 4 a.m. in 20 years ago now, um, uh, is that there's a certain conception that I'm going to call neutralism. And like, any, like many ideological conceptions, and I'll say more what I mean by ideology soon, and you know, a third of my book is about what I mean by ideology, so I'll, I'll wheel that in. Um, it's uh, highly connected with, with I, I think, Butler's um, discussions. Uh, so, um, so I think there's, there's a, a view, I'm calling it neutralism, uh, the view that there's a philosophical ideal of neutrality, and that's what I want to both subject to criticism and critique here. So um, I'm not going to say that neutralism makes sense, because I don't think it makes sense. I think it's, what, it's, so, it's something that people who pride themselves on making sense presuppose, but I don't think that makes it, means it makes sense. I don't think it makes sense, and I'm going to argue that it doesn't make sense. Um, so I'm going to sketch it, but don't like get mad at me when you notice immediately that it doesn't make sense, because <laughs> that will be my point. <laughs> so, um, so, so I think Neutralism, uh, so according to neutralism, the domain of philosophy is restricted to topics that are universal and not only and not even chiefly accessible from certain experiential perspectives. The claims in a philosophical argument do not cite particularities of fact, as history does, for example, and do not persuade by eliciting emotion as a narrative or literature. Philosophical reasoning only appeals to inferences and principles that are recognized as valid by anyone capable of reason. In an important sense, sense such principles are not ideological. In a way, I will explain. 
The arguments also possess a clearly articulable and recognizable structure that demarcates them as instances of such neutral and universally acceptable reasoning patterns. Now I'm going to need to say what I mean. So I think, I think the idea, and tell me if you've heard this, I'm sure everyone has, who's, who, uh, uh, oh, feminist philosophy, critical race theory, uh, that's ideological. And what do they mean by that? What they mean by that is something like this. Um, it's people want a certain result, it's political, it's connected to their identity in some way, and so it isn't really properly what we do, you know, because if political, then ideological, ideological, then not neutral, something like that. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to criticize this uh, ideology <laughs> uh, uh, from a number of directions. Um, so um, now, but first, a little bit more about the ideology, the ramifications of accepting this kind of new, uh, ramifications of accepting neutrality as a philosophical ideal. So what if you thought this was like what philosophy is? Well, then you'd think that philosophy would be explicable by what one might think of as abstract problem solving. So the use of neutral reasoning and neutral perspective independent reasons in the resolution of various philosophical puzzles. The standard tools would be something like logic and probability. And indeed we find that those tools are, I mean, some of my best friends are logicians. Uh, I mean, I, I use those tools. I'm not dissing those tools. I'm just saying, I'm dissing the restriction of inquiry to those tools. Um, I'm saying, Neutralism would lead you to think that those are the legitimate tools. So if philosophy is guided by neutralism, by this sort of, sort of vague thought of neutralism as I've sketched it, then successful philosophers will be thought, sought among those who are stereotypically regarded as having a high degree of abstract problem solving skills, rather than insight gained from life experience or broad cultural historical knowledge. Now I think as many, many of you know, um, because of all the press that's gotten over the past few weeks, Sarah Jane Leslie, with co-authors, has published a paper in Science called Expectations of Brilliance Underlie Gender Distributions Across Academic Disciplines. And she asked 1,800 people in 30 different disciplines uh, what, whether you think success in the discipline is due to hard work or raw innate knowledge. And what she found is philosophy even more than math is raw innate knowledge. It, of all disciplines, American philosophers respond raw innate knowledge. Now it's only 50 philosophers who responded, so there's still a, um, and, and I worry about the setup because I worry about the dichotomy between hard work and raw innate knowledge does not leave a gap for perspective and experience. So I, I have critiques of uh, Leslie's setup because I think it can play into the hands of those who, who, want to, who want to exclude. Because those aren't the only options. <laughs> Success can be due to a position of exclusion. Um, you know, I did an author meets critics on my book in Cheshire Correctional Facility with Lori Groon's, Lori Groon, this political philosopher, has been teaching these 13 prisoners for five years political philosophy, and they've, you know, I've never been in a group of 13 people who've done 10 semesters of political philosophy. I mean, who's done that? She's like, yeah, I'm running out of stuff to teach them. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it was actually like I patronized them like halfway through the first question and I was like, okay. Um, so, but, but you know, this was an, although Lori is a, uh, so that most of them are lifers and although, and, uh, and you know, although Lori is an analytic political philosopher and unlike me does not, love people who hate our people like Carl Schmitt. I'm very into Carl Schmitt. Uh, and, uh, so these students somehow discovered all of this by themselves. And they're like, Professor Stanley, I know you analytic types don't like Agamben, but you, given your book, you really need to read The State of Exception. And so, you know, what I realized, and there's one six-year-old guy I kept on calling, I called him Clyde the Carl Schmitt guy because he's so into Carl Schmitt. I mean, this is a, a, a group of political philosophers whose favorite concept is the concept of the exception and that's because they're serving life sentences in prison. You know, and so that tells you that life experience gives you a certain philosophical vision. So I worry that that's not a node in uh, Leslie's 
uh, framework. And I'm already seeing philosophers using Leslie to say, oh look, we don't need to change the topics of philosophy, we just need to tell people it's hard work rather than brilliance. So be careful of that. So while I'm going to praise Leslie, I think we all need to be warned, we all need to be beware, w w wary that some people are out there saying, oh, it's just hard work, <laughs> and not, you know, uh, whereas I think it's clear that some, you know, Gramsci's prison notebooks uh, had a lot to do with where they were written. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, so, so I think, but neutralism is, I think, an explanation for what's going on with, uh, with um, or, or introduction to mathematical logic was also written in prison. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, I would be, as Russell says, I'd be writing this even if uh, I were dead from the waist down and not merely in a prison cell. <laughs> so, um, so, so neutralism is, uh, um, so let's, so if, if you thought neutralism was the right model of philosophy, it's clear why you would think that philosophy was math-like in its features, although math requires a ton of hard work. So I, uh, uh, you would think, you know, uh, raw, I think, so I'm, I, I suspect that this kind of conception of what philosophical inquiry is underlies the raw innate knowledge uh, thought. Oh yeah, and then, and then Leslie discovers that gender exclusion, the more uh, uh, is a function uh, largely of this feature. So, sorry, I, for, I, for those of you who don't know this. So she, she discovers that the more raw innate knowledge is thought to be explicable of, for, uh, of, of success and in discipline, the fewer women there are in it. Um, now again, I worry, uh, so, so philosophy is very highly thought of as involved, I mean, uh, of all disciplines, it stands out as most marked by successes due to raw innate knowledge, and so hence that's the explanation of the diversity problem. Now, again, now that I've explained that, I think you can see the previous worry I raised in even more detail because I like to make a distinction between, in my head, between content feminists and, and procedural feminists. So when, when I gave a talk on Christy Dotson at the APA, uh, Nancy Bauer set up, you know, she had set up this session, Men Behaving Splendidly, How to Organize a Gender Balanced Conference, with all men setting me up, <laughs> uh, giving talks. <laughs> She's like, yeah, we did a session on gender balanced conferences last year, and eight people showed up, you know, and it was all women, so I, we thought, let's make it controversial. Do you mind? So it was like rough. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but it was packed, it worked. And, uh, uh, but I gave a talk arguing that, um, following Dotson, that it was exclusions of topics that were responsible for, ex exclusion of topics and methodologies that were responsible uh, for lack of diversity. And to give you a sense of the content versus procedural feminism dichotomy, uh, one of my former students, uh, I won't say her name, but raised her hand and said, I don't know what Jason was talking about, but can we get back to blind refereeing? So that would be the divide. There are some people who think the diversity problem has to do with procedure. We just shift our procedures and we'll get suddenly blacks and women rushing into philosophy once we do more blind refereeing. And others of us think that it has to do with an exclusion of topics where suddenly Du Bois is not, you know, social theory. Social theory is suddenly not philosophy. So, you know. Um, so, so you can, so Leslie, I think, is being used by people who think it's all procedural. So, but nevertheless, you can see that if neutralism is correct, you would, you would, you would, if, if, if neutralism were the ideology, um, uh, people would be, uh, w would be drawn to a view that philosophy is math-like. Um, now, okay, so, uh, now, we're, um, we're, I think, familiar with, I mean, there's a number of criticisms in feminist philosophy about the gendered nature of the discourse of rationality and objectivity, and this is Pateman's point in the sexual contract, Mills's point in the racial contract, that uh, 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 
uh, Michelle Alexander's point in uh, 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 mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness. Uh, uh, so the idea is that there are these these ideals of these ideals of uh, neutrality have an exclusionary function. Um, now, uh, so, uh, but I think that there's, uh, there's, uh, so my, my first, um, uh, my, my first, so some of those I'm not going to discuss, I'm not going to discuss, uh, since we're familiar, well, in particular, there's a criticism of neutrality that's like Genevieve Lloyd's man of criticism of rationality and man of reason, that the social meanings of rationality talk are gendered. Um, and I'm sympathetic to that view, but it's so explored that that's not going to be my criticism of, of neutralism. Um, my criticism of neutralism, uh, so, um, so, uh, so I, have, I have four other criticisms. So. Um, the first objection is that it's unfair to some people and hence in an important sense fails to be neutral. I'm just going to mention this objection as a social justice point. So Patricia Hill Collins argues in Black Feminist Thought that black women intellectuals have been drawn to projects that have a chance to improve ordinary social practices and that very different kinds of thought and theories emerge when abstract thought is joined with pragmatic action. If she's right, then restricting the methodology of philosophy to abstract problem-solving uh, problem excludes certain traditions of philosophy. And this is a double injustice when those traditions are ones favored by groups that were previously unjustly excluded simply on the basis of race and gender. And this is a point you find in Dotson's work as well, like every point I make as usual is in Dotson's work. Um, so um, the second point is about ide ideology. So I said, and this is I think the most of the, our 2 a.m. bar talks arguments with our fellow philosophers, this comes up. Um, if it's political, then it's ideological. So what is that? So, and if it's ideological, it's not philosophical. So let's ask, let's interrogate that. Let's ask what ideological belief is. So I have just written a book on the nature of ideology, um, so I'm not going to rehearse all of that here, although we'll discuss that. Um, Maeve, I think, comments are going to be on that um, part, the theory of ideology in my book. Oh, oh you changed it. Oh, propaganda. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, so, so let me say just a little bit about my view of ideology, and I think it's a widely shared one um, because I saw repercussions. Of, I saw it, I see it in Butler's work and, uh, and, I, and lots of others. So I think um, Sally Haslinger has a nice way of uh, thinking about it. Uh, ideology is a representation of social life that serves in some way to undergird social practices. Um, the idea is an ideology is, is the precondition for your social identity. And this is the theory I take in my, in my book. What a theory of ideology is trying to explain is, so here's how I think of the, the theory of ideology. What it's trying to explain is why some beliefs and conceptual schemes don't get revised in light of experience. Why they stay, why even though no matter how much evidence you have against them, they stay the same. And this is, and that's what you want to explain. And the way I want to explain it, and when I say I, I, I think this is a very wide way of thinking of ideology, widely shared. In the analytic tradition, it's Haslinger who's most, who's articulated it, I think, most clearly. Um, it's, uh, is that, well, ideological beliefs or ideological conceptual schemes are so resistant to revision because they're part, you're committed to them as part of your identity. And so abandoning them means abandoning your friends <laughs> and abandoning the stability that, that, has been so, that, that gives you your sense of self. Uh, and this is not just ideological beliefs, but um, but, ide but ideology cannot, is not just as, as Miranda Fricker and many others have argued. Ideology is, uh, an ideology is also conceptual schemes. So Iris Murdoch in, the idea, in the, uh, the idea of Perfection talks about a mother and a daughter-in-law. And the mother thinks that the daughter-in-law is vulgar, uh, undignified, crass. Uh, and, uh, and then she comes, then after a few years, the mother-in-law starts to think, hmm, I'm awfully jealous of my daughter-in-law. 
maybe I've been thinking with this set of concepts that orders the social world into hierarchies because I'm jealous. <laughs> Let me rethink here. And then she realizes that what she had thought of as undignified, as undignified was in fact spontaneous. She decides to adopt a new set of concepts that don't order the social world this way. So you can have a conceptual scheme being ideological, being you, you, you endorse a Murdoch's point is you think of the social world with this conceptual scheme because of your social identity. And I want to, um, and I want to emphasize following Haslinger that an ideology is neutral and that's crucial to, to my discussions of ideology. Uh, I think when you start off you know, with propaganda and ideology, you start off, okay, these, they're bad, let's do the bad thing. And then you realize you can't really theorize with a non-neutral notion. You know? uh, so, so I theorize with a, following Hassling with it. We all have ideologies. We all have social worlds. We all have ideologies. We all have the beliefs that make us who we are. And many ideological beliefs are instances of knowledge. Like, I'm a cosmopolitan, northeastern intellectual who, you know, who doesn't like to conceive himself as existing outside New York City. I'm ideologically committed to the theory of evolution, for example. I'm ideologically committed to all people are equal, like tolerance. Um, now, I think I know those things are true, but it's still the case that in some far off distant world where, we, where you know, uh, creationism were correct, I would still probably be a theory of evolution guy, um, so person. So, uh, so I have these commitments that are, so you can have an ideological belief that's your ideological belief because it's who you are, but it, you still know it. I mean, it's, there's no contradiction between something being ideological and something being a core case of knowledge. This actually scotches a number of theories of ideology. Like, you might say an ideological belief is one that's formed that has the wrong causal source, like think of Hume on causality or religious belief. It has the wrong causal source. And so it isn't knowledge because it doesn't arrive, derive from the facts. Well, I don't think that's correct. I think we should say instead an ideological belief is one that is connected to our social identity. It's one that, that or, and concept, con a set of concepts is one that we think with because those are the concepts that someone with my social identity thinks with. Now, um, uh, uh, so now I've said that everyone has a social identity. In her discussion, in her well-known discussion of sovereign individuality, Judith Butler notes that, of course, some people act as if they were never formed. I mean the one talk she just gave. And Butler rightly points out that sovereign individuality is itself a social identity. So that, you know, uh, if there were sovereign individuals, they wouldn't have ideologies. <laughs> but that is, of course, uh, I think, an ideology <laughs> that there are sovereign individuals. And so that's why I'm quoting the previous talk in this one. Um, so um, so uh, now there's 60 years of social psychology on, uh, on ideology. And this is, th these are things I connect, I discuss a lot in my book. Um, so, uh, so, for instance, in Haskell and Cantrell's 1954 paper, they saw a game. Uh, they, I think it's the Harvard-Yale game. They asked Yale students and Harvard students about controversial calls that were made. And it turns out Yale students and Harvard students had very different views about the calls. Um, uh, so, uh, and they seem to firmly have those views. And so there's 50 years of research, 60 years of research. So my colleague Dan Kahan um, has this paper, the 2012 paper called They Saw a Demonstration. And he presents, he's the same video, it's a building, and there are some demonstrators. And police heard the demonstrators off the sidewalk and further away from the building. And he splits, he gets conservatives and progressives and splits them into four groups shows them the same video, all four groups. One group of conservatives is, is and, and he asks them the following question, did the police violate the protesters' First Amendment rights to free speech? First Amendment means something very different in India, by the way. Uh, so uh, there it's the opposite. Uh, but uh, so did, they, did, they, did the police violate the free speech rights of the protesters? So the first, uh, 
the first group of conservatives is told it's an abortion clinic. The second group is told it's a military recruitment center. Uh, the group that's told it's an, it's an abortion clinic, over 70% says the police violated the free speech rights of the demonstrators. The group that's told um, it's a uh, military barracks, a military recruitment center, only 13% of the conservatives say the police violated the First Amendment rights of the demonstrators. Now, sadly, I think Dan Cahan, I mean, I love him dearly, and he's the only person I've ever experienced where you send him a manuscript the night before, 200 pages, he reads the whole thing and meets with you for six hours. Um, but, uh, but he's in the ideology of neutralism. All of his work is like, conservatives act the same as progressives, <laughs> which is depressing, because I like to think we're right. Um, but, um, <laughs> but it's just reversed with my team. <laughs> we do the same thing. We're like, oh yeah, if it's an abortion clinic, they violated their rights. Uh, sorry, if it's an abortion clinic, uh, they acted correctly. If it's a military recruitment center, they violated their rights. So, um, so there's just a ton of work on how our social identities affect our firm beliefs. Um, and that is, I think, I, I just think that there's, uh, there's um, and there's just a ton of different, uh, of different social psychology, I won't go through all of it here, but I try to assemble that. I, what I try to do in my book is assemble that and connect it with critical social theory, connect the social psychology with critical social theory. So, okay, so what I've said is we all have ideologies. Some of them, we can know, we can have an, uh, an ideological belief can be knowledge. My belief that theory of evolution is true is ideological and it's definitely knowledge. <laughs> Um, so being ideological is not an epistemic criticism in and of itself. It's just pointing out, it's a belief you're not going to give up. <laughs> um, but then people could say, oh wait, that's not philosophical not to give up beliefs in the light of evidence. You know. Um, so let's look at the practice of areas of philosophy that are regarded as, as not having this feature of ideological, of I, not being ideolo uh, ideological. If those areas, if say disputes in logic were governed by neutralism, were not ideological in this sense, we might feel justified in, ex in accepting various exclusionary consequences of embracing neutralism as an ideal. The second objection I want to level against neutralism is that logic enjoys no such privileged status. There's no universal agreement on the logical laws in philosophy today. There's no universal agreement about the correct methods of reasoning. There are extremely smart people with a lot of uh, theorems to their name who disagree about bivalence, about excluded middle, about almost any claim, fundamental principle of logic. Timothy Williamson rightly warns us quote, to be suspicious of any attempt to bound logic or metalogic to the insubstantive, the non-ideological, much though we may long for such a neutral arbiter to a disciplined philosophical debate, we cannot always have one, unquote. And this is a claim about disputes in logic. Williamson, of course, is a, is a uh, fervent advocate of bivalence. Um, so what does Williamson mean? Well, there is no, what I think, we've learned as a result, I mean, Dummett seek, sought this, but it wasn't successful. I think everyone in the philosophy of logic accepts that if you've got two people who disagree about a fundamental mode of reasoning, there just is no neutral way to adjudicate between them. The only thing to do is both of them just should go theorize with their, idea, with their fundamental belief and then see which overall picture of the world it has more elegance, has more plausibility, coheres together. Whatever virtues, whatever, you know, difficult to describe virtues <laughs> there are about a full worldview. That's how you do it in logic. <laughs> um, and, well, what about Williamson's attraction to bivalence? Is it political? 
Well, anyone who knows Timothy Williamson knows that it's political. It's his commitment to realism. And, you know, uh, and he thinks, you know, his political stance is that uh, is uh, realism and, you know, epistemic norms are the only norms. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and realism is true. I mean, he's deeply committed to realism as and part of his social identity. He's a, he came into Oxford when everyone was an anti-realist. It's part of his identity defending realism. Um, <laughs> Grand Priest's attraction to non-classical logic is connected to his deep uh, uh, involvement with Eastern philosophy. He's this incredible martial arts person who spends every year, like for long periods of time, immersed in Eastern philosophy. And you know, hence when uh, uh, Jainism, when he talks about uh, his his defenses of non-classical logic, are deeply connected to who Grand Priest is. And there is no neutral method by which you can decide between non-classical logic and classical logic. In the semantic meta theory, you're always appealing to whatever principles of logic you want to justify. So, you know, people with different views about the nature of logic will appeal to meta theories where they presuppose their own views. And we're all familiar with that in the philosophy of logic. So now Hume is engaged in critique. Um, when he discusses religious belief. But so is Williamson when he discusses vagueness. Um, Williamson says in, 1994, in his 1994 book, what he's trying to account for is why people believe that vague predicates have fuzzy boundaries. He has a long argument trying to explain why it's natural to believe that, even though it's false. That's kind of, because for him, vague predicates have sharp boundaries. That's like, Hume's arguments about religious belief, why it's natural to believe, uh, why, why we're sort of impelled to have religious belief independently of whether or not it's true. So that kind of, the methodology of critiquing a view, <laughs> not just criticizing it, is part and parcel of what philosophers do. Um, yeah, uh, so three more minutes. Um, okay. Now, uh, now uh, yeah, uh, so um, now, let me, um, let me, I've already covered the third criticism, which is that the one, and it's familiar from the works of Eileen O'Neill and Charles Mills, so, which is that if neutralism, if all the philosophers in the recognized historical canon were guided by neutralism, it would have the historical centrality that is useful in an exercise of disciplinary taxonomy. But the fact that the Western philosophical canon begins with the works of Plato, which is narratively rich and suggests a certain degree of hypocrisy in excluding contemporary works from the domain of philosophy that substantively employ narrative and myth. Um, and the final point I want to make, which I think is very important, is that it's inconsistently applied. Think of, think of, uh, so we th neutralism says matters of particular fact aren't really relevant. We want sort of logic, probability, things that hold in every possible world, but look at Philo look at how science is treated in philosophy. In philosophy departments, we all know we need people who know tons of physics and tons of biology. So physics, of course, gets privileged because the littler things are, the more fundamental they are, apparently. Um, <laughs> gender, not fundamental. Uh, uh, the, uh, so, uh, so, um, so the fourth objection is that it's inconsistently applied. Like, Everybody is like, oh, we need people who know lots of particular facts about physics. So why don't we need people who know a lot of, why don't we need normative theorists in political philosophy who know a lot of particular facts about history? <laughs> um, why don't we need people who know facts about narrative, why, uh, about literature? Um, so it seems that there's a radical distinction between how we treat metaphysics and how we treat political philosophy. Um, so. Uh, so I think that, uh, I hope that, I think it's a, a very interesting question why we ended up with neutralism. Um, and I hope I've given some reasons to think that, uh, that the view itself um, is incoherent. Thank you. Thank you.